perspective shift happening. Not only are psychedelic mushrooms gaining traction and mainstream popularity, but the medical benefits of non-psychedelic functional mushrooms are also rising to the surface. With the alarming rise in depression, anxiety, and PTSD, traditional Western medicines still responds to the mental health crisis, primarily with pharmaceutical medications, but that's not the only option. Patients are seeking natural ingredients and alternative medicine to help increase their mental health and performance, and practitioners are turning more and more to natural, holistic, and sustainable solutions that incorporate medicinal mushrooms and adaptogens. Brilliant Blends is meeting these needs with their dual supplement line, developed by Dr. Joquita Handy. Each Brilliant Blend supplement contains carefully selected premium quality adaptogens that were formulated with 30 years of experience of naturopathy and hands-on nutrition. ADAPT is an adaptogen supplement that is designed to enhance memory, support the immune system, aid in sleep, and help protect the body from the effects of stress. Enrich is a powerful brain enhancement blend that helps to elevate mood and increase energy levels while promoting deep concentration and peak performance. You can learn more about the science behind each blend on their website, brilliantblends.me, and use code PT10 for 10% off. Also keep an eye out for our upcoming webinar to learn about how to incorporate adaptogens into your microdosing routine, as well as learn from individuals who have used Brilliant blends to help wean off antidepressants and anti anxiety medication. Hey everyone, Manesh Gurn, aka the Psychedelic Scientist, here. I'm super excited to announce the launch of the second cohort of our eight week live taught online course, Psychedelic Neuroscience Demystified How Psychedelics Alter Consciousness and Produce Therapeutic Effects. The course is taught by yours truly and my good friend and colleague, Dr. Melanie Pincus. Our course combines live group classes with in-depth video lectures and will give you a solid understanding of key concepts and principles in psychedelic neuroscience. We've designed everything to be as layperson friendly as possible and importantly, have a close eye on deriving evidence-based practical applications for psychedelic therapy throughout the course. Throughout the course, you'll also have the opportunity to connect with like-minded individuals and engage in meaningful discussions about this exciting emerging field. So whether you're a mental health professional, researcher, or just interested in expanding your personal and professional knowledge, this course is designed for anyone looking to have a deeper understanding of the neuroscience underlying psychedelic therapy. Classes start on October 4th, and you can find out more information and enroll at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Come join us on our journey into the brain on psychedelics. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Psychedelics Today. This is your host, Kyle Buller. And today on the show, I have the pleasure of sitting down with General Stephen Zanakis, MD. Uh, Dr. Zanakis is an adult, child, and adolescent psychiatrist with many years of clinical, academic, and management experience. And he's also the executive director of APA the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association. APA is both the accreditation body for the psychedelic field and the National Association for Practitioners. And APA's mission is to safely integrate psychedelics into the U.S. healthcare system. This episode was recorded live in Denver uh, during the Psychedelic Science Conference. Um, and I think we might have one more uh, maybe two more uh, episodes coming from uh, Psychedelic Science still. So still part of this kind of map series. We're kind of teasing them out um, over time. But yeah, this is really fun. It's been really fun to, to sit down with everybody at the conference and record these episodes. So in this episode, uh, Dr. Zanakis and I chat about what APA is, what their goals are, um, acc the accreditation process for education programs, we talk about developing uh, ethical guidelines, and actually, APA uh, co-published the first professional practice uh, guidelines for psychedelic-assisted therapies with Brain Futures. Uh, you could check out these uh, guidelines at APA-US.org, um, and these guidelines are designed to address the evolving practice of psychedelic-assisted therapy as a set of comprehensive guidelines for mental health providers practicing psychedelic therapy. So yeah, go check that out if you haven't seen that already. You can go to um, apa.us.org and just click on standards and guidelines in their navigation bar there. Um, we also talk about uh, how do we train practitioners, uh, the training process, and then uh, what clinicians need to know about psychedelics. And we also talk about this idea of building a safety net uh, for uh, those that may have had maybe adverse uh, 
uh, events on psychedelics and may have had difficult experiences they, they need to process so yeah what does a safety net look like uh, which i think is a very important topic um, that we need to have more conversations about as uh, psychedelics become more mainstream so uh, if yeah again if you want to learn more about what appa is up to uh, you can check out appa.us.org definitely an organization to follow to know about and if you are a practitioner maybe uh, check out their membership and getting involved over there because appa is definitely going to be uh, playing a big role um, in standardizing uh, psychedelic psychedelic therapy and again as their mission uh, statement says uh, they're going to be one of the uh, one of the main organizations to try to integrate psychedelics into the u.s healthcare system so with that i hope you enjoy this episode with uh, general steven zanakis and we will catch you on the other side Hey, what's up, everybody? Joe Moore here. Just want to let you know about a few Navigating Psychedelics offerings we have coming up. On September 25th, we kick off our first ever Australia cohort of Navigating Psychedelics. We've partnered with a really amazing lead instructor, Renee, and um, she's got an amazing resume and is worth checking out. So if you're in Australia or the Pacific Rim, like check out the offerings we've got going there. Uh, for Australia. Um, we have a second cohort kicking up in October as well. So again, September 25 and again in October. So check that out. It's like delicatesay.com slash events. We've got a neuroscience course coming up October 4th. So check that out. Manesh Gurn and Melanie Pincus, both of whom have been on the show a few times. And this is the second time we're offering this one. So I uh, expect another sold out cohort of that. It's going to be an amazing multi-week program. We've got a two-day offering coming up. Kyle and I are going to be in Miami teaching Navigating Psychedelics, Vital Tools for Risk Reduction and Integration. We'll give you all sorts of tools for harm reduction, risk reduction, integration tools, and uh, we'll even do some mini breathwork stuff to give you an experience that's helpful. We've got a nine-week uh, amazing program coming up starting October 10, Navigating Psychedelics, Jewish Informed Perspectives on Psychedelics. That's going to be amazing. David Trapkin is developing a new curriculum uh, there, and we'll be teaching that from Israel. Uh, he's moving there real soon. And then November 1, nine-week Navigating Psychedelics program. That's going to be extraordinary. And um, that would be led by Kyle. There's just going to be CE available for that. And then in November 10, uh, November 10, we're going to do the same thing we're doing in Miami, but in Denver. So Kyle and I will teach that one November 10 and 11. It'll be uh, two eight-hour days. And it's going to be an amazing uh, class for risk reduction and, and integration tools in ed. So it's kind of the PT update on classes. So check us out and more coming soon. Thanks everybody for listening. All right. General Steven Zanakis, MD. Welcome to Psychedelics Today. Really excited to have you here today. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. Thanks. Um, could you do a, a nice little intro for our guests and listeners of who you are and you know how did you end up here at Psychedelic Science? Well, thanks so much. And I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with all of you. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and uh, also I've been a career army officer. I was a brigadier general, a commanding general for all the Southeast for the army. And uh, spent uh, my life sort of helping our soldiers and families because I thought that was very important. And yeah. I've gone on since retirement to uh, continue in getting involved and in promoting what I think are the best health practices. And not only for our military and our veterans, but also for our communities. Uh, for years, I've been interested in finding the best treatments uh, for the kinds of things that, uh, kinds of experiences and problems that uh, men and women encounter. And uh, here we have, I've uh, actually, my experience with these medicines and the treatments goes back 50 years. Yeah. I was in San Francisco in the 1970s, and uh, we saw a, a many uh, situations where people were doing these treatments mm -hmm. and uh, and not quite as a regulated setting, but we're looking for ways to to handle the kinds of problems. So it's been a continuing interest. And several years ago, I was asked about now returning and seeing how we can do this and uh, find ways that we can mainstream it, bringing into yeah. our healthcare system. So I've had the opportunity, I've been asked to become now the executive director 
of the American Psychedelics Practitioners Association. And I think it's a great privilege and a chance to really help out again. Yeah, that's amazing. Congratulations on Thanks. that uh, new appointment uh, position. Curious. I think some of our listeners, they're somewhat familiar with APA. I know we've probably talked about them a few times on, on the podcast. And also, you know, I think it's going to play a, a big role in kind of standardizing education and training in this field. And would love to just hear um, a little bit more about what APA is, their mission, and yeah, what you guys are doing over there. So it's the American Psychedelic Practitioners Association. It's the National Association for Accreditation of practitioners in the field. And it's also the association that brings these practitioners together as a community. Mm. Uh, our, there are many pathways for people to get feeling healing and to get the kind of help they need. And of course, it's very important at this time with the mental health crisis and what we're seeing in terms of the any number of people that are feeling that they're desperate to get, uh, particularly after COVID, to get some help. Yeah. So we're the pathway we're going to follow is that for the practitioners. How do we bring them together? How do we bring information and knowledge? How do we train them? How do we develop best practices? And that uh, they're confident in what they're doing and their patients and their communities that they're working in are confident that they're getting what they feel that they need and is going to be most helpful. Yeah, amazing. And I remember maybe it was a year ago I was chatting with somebody over there and they were talking that there could be potentially two tracks. There will be a, a, a track for licensure for licensed practitioners, psychiatrists, mental health workers, and then also maybe a, a track towards those that maybe aren't have a professional license. Is that still going to be the case? Well, I think we're going to explore that and return to figure that out. out. I mean, right now, we're putting more of our time and energy into licensed practitioners because yeah. that's the pathway when it comes to clinical care right. that we know about and we're familiar. Uh, there are clearly other ways and other options that people are going to have, and we want to make sure that they are also open and that gets developed as it needs to be. Yeah. And what does this pathway look like to try to um, get training more standardized and get it approved? Because it sounds like we're trying to do this on a national level, right? This is a very new field and it seems like APA and I think also the Board of Psychedelic Medicine and Therapies, we're trying to create a little bit of standardization. So what does the pathway look like um, to get this more standardized? Well, we have to very systematically uh, develop the training programs and then the accreditation for those training programs. The first step is we've taken and we're looking and then hopefully in the next several days, we'll publish professional practice guidelines. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of saying to other practitioners, to governmental agencies, to payers, people looking at the field, there's now a legitimacy to this. Mm -hmm. We're really a professional group. And we have set up some core principles that we subscribe to so that we can be good practitioners. So that's step one. And then the next step is, for us, we're thinking that most importantly, importantly will be for us to formulate and also publish ethical guidelines. Mm, yeah. Big concern here. Yeah, huge so, topic. Huge yeah. topic. And legitimately, right? I mean, you know, the... The rule in medicine is primum non nocere, which means first do no harm. That means we as practitioners have to be ethical. Mm -hmm. We have to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that in working with our patients, we're providing safe, legal, ethical treatments. So that'll be our, more than likely we're looking at that as our next project. We then have to go along and say, now let's think about clinical practice guidelines. How do we know who is the right patient? How are they screened? How are they informed about what is going to occur? Uh, how do we understand what they want out of the treatment? Yeah. And then how are we monitor that? And we're confident and they're confident that we've done what, what needed to be done. So we'll then develop clinical practice guidelines. Then from there, we're going to look at, take all that knowledge and build it into the core elements of a curriculum mm. of training. So those people that want to do this work understand 
These are the basics. This is what the fundamentals, this is what they need to know. And uh, in our training programs, you'll learn this and you'll know that you have it. Having done that, then they can go get certification. Mm-hmm. And that's where the board comes into play. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. The way I've always kind of like conceptualized it, having uh, training in, in mental health counseling was almost opposite, kind of like uh, KCREP. And then coming in, kind of doing the curriculum development and then the Board of Psychedelic Medicine Therapy is kind of like the MBCC. And um, is that, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with the counseling kind of field, but that's how I kind of always um, kind of conceptualize how these uh, two two organizations are going to start working together. I think that's a, a good way. I mean, yeah. I mean, we have to understand that in order to, we need a workforce that is really out throughout the country. I mean, we're, we're looking at a time when there are millions of people that want care and support. Yeah. And we have to understand that they live in all sorts of different communities. And what our responsibility is to uh, find ways to support and train the people that are in those communities to provide those this treatment to the people that need it. And the counseling, you know, example and legacy of what happens to counseling is very useful. Yeah. What challenges do you see yourself um, kind of battling up against trying to become this accreditation board? Every challenge you can think of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're we're now you know, making some, uh, this is a, an endeavor. Yes. It's been around actually for hundreds of years in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we are coming out of the, what happened in the seventies and in a sense kind of overcoming that, but we have to now prepare these people to provide these treatments. One of the first challenges is to shift the model of clinical care. Mm. We live in a world of disease-centered treatments, and we want to shift a patient-centered model. We want to know that we're not just treating your symptoms. We're not just treating the problems that you have, that what you're getting out of this is, in fact, helping you live the life that you want to live. What do those outcomes look like? How do we know they are? How do we collaborate with you? It's a partnership. It's a rapport. It's an alliance between you and me so that we're getting, you're getting what you feel is most important and we're doing our job in providing it. That's a big shift in medicine. That's huge. I was going to say, I feel like that is like, yeah, how is that shift going to happen, right? That's one that's pretty step big. at a time. One step at a time, yeah. <laughs> we're going to grind away at it. Yeah. We've conceptualized it. There are lots of people talking about the patient-centered model, so that's good. Are we throwing the DSM out the window at that point? Or? Well, <laughs> we have to rethink that DSM. Yeah. Because, I mean, that DSM is based on a disease um, state model. And really, patients are not diagnoses. Yeah. Patients are really are, have all sorts of other experiences. So it's useful. And it's clearly useful to the payers Mm -hmm. and the government, the CMS. But we need to rethink that and understand it might have its place, but really what's most important in terms of our our treatment and what you need. Yeah. Do you think psychedelics are playing a role in how we view mental health? Oh, I think they could be the real game changer. Yeah. How so, in your opinion? Because Because of exactly those points. Yeah. And uh, that if you're going to do this in a way that people are confident and they're thinking about the patient and the outcomes, that really forces the field to rethink what they're doing. The other game changer will be that in order to be done effectively, we have to have prescribers and therapists and support systems all integrated. The current system is rather siloed and compartmentalized. Yeah. I mean, most patients go down an assembly line. That's not what it seems to work the best here. So we're, the other game changer element is we're going to build teams. Mm, so important. Functional teams. Yeah. And that, that's so important. I remember I had um, a colleague and friend that was going to Academy and IV treatment center. And they, 
I don't know why, but I was like, you know, because they, they reached out to me for like some integration support. And then I was like, you know, is the um, psychiatrist or whoever's administering helping you to find like a therapist to work with? And they're like, no. And then I was like, well, you should probably talk to try to, you know, find uh, this support. And they're like, they just don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like, wow, that's, you know, we, we need teams, right? We like need this teams. is a holistic approach. And so a lot of people have grown up in this world where they don't do that, that they yeah. live in their own little bubbles. And in fact, sometimes you've got folks that are worried that they can't reach out of that bubble, that yeah. somebody's going to say something. We need to understand that that's, at this point, that's not best practices. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, going back to, I guess, APA and, and training. So we have a lot of students within our, our network. And I know the one question is, you know, there's a lot of cer- uh, certification programs already popping up. For those that have already been through some sort of certification program, like, you know, how does that work? Do people, like, if you guys do finally get to the part of like being accredited and, and offering uh, kind of like this license path, you know, would people need to then kind of retake some sort of accredited program? Or have you guys been thinking about that? Like, what does we that look like? We haven't given it as depth thought as we need to. I think yeah. that's one of the first things we've got to um, tackle. Yeah. And we know that there's a lot of people that have had a lot of training and have a lot of experience. And so let's make this uh, what's most practical and also that is uh, most reasonable as we're looking to build a training force of, of practitioners in the field. Yeah. And maybe you don't know this, but I'm just kind of curious, like a timeline, like, you know, how do you, what do you see the timeline being with uh, the work that you guys are doing? As soon as we can get it done. I mean, look, if, that'd be I'm, awesome. I mean, That'd'd it's around amazing. the corner. Yeah. We might get MDMA next year as approval through the FDA. Yeah. We might get psilocybin approved the FDA. There's, all sorts of things happen in the States. I think for us, we've got to run as fast Move as we quick. can. Yeah. Um, do you see any sort of like governmental hangups there to try to move quick? I mean, if it does get F- like MDMA and psilocybin become FDA approved, I mean, they should be able to work to kind of want to create some standardization and accreditation, right? I, or, I've been an advocate for some time and yeah. engaging the government in this process. I think it, there has to be a partnership of all the stakeholders. And I think the government is a very important, obviously a very important stakeholder. I think it's a challenge because they have procedures that have really been in place for a number of years. And now it's actually just as as a game changer for the field, it can be a game changer for government policies and procedures. Uh, So I think we need to do that very actively and get them in a very vigorous conversation to make these changes. Yeah, yeah. It'd be amazing. I just... It's crazy to be part of this psychedelic uh, field for quite a while and just watching the rapid growth that's happened even within the past like three, four years. Mm. Um, how are you feeling about it? Uh, one, uh, one, it's a privilege to be a part of yeah. it. Yeah. Right here we have a chance to do good. And uh, I'm glad that I can have a role and I work with an incredibly gifted team to have that role. And I work with other people that are in this field and that we can make uh, a difference. I'm not surprised that it's all going to just, you percolate, percolate, go, 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 go. Then all of a sudden, boom, it just explodes. (laughs) That's how things happen. So we're at an inflection point. And uh, the challenge for those of us who are trying to lead this movement is to leverage the opportunities that that inflection point gives in the best way that we can. Yeah. So just going back to what you said earlier when you started off, you know, living uh, in the 70s and in, in the Bay Area, um, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of afraid at how fast things are moving to, you know, are we going to make the same mistakes? Hmm. What would be some of those mistakes? And do you have, like, what are some of your fears around the, the, as the movement grows? One, we don't build a safety net. I yeah. mean, what we saw, I was, you know, I was a young doctor there and working in emergency rooms as well as working in hospitals and clinics that there were people that had experiences and had adverse events. Yeah. And then sometimes they also had other side effects or problems that they lived. And I think that as As practitioners, we have a responsibility to build a safety net, to know what those are, and to also uh, be able to give them the treatment and support if such a thing happens to them. Uh, We have a responsibility to figure out uh, who really are the right patients for Mm -hmm. the right treatment. 
And how are we going to put that together and make sure that they get it? Yeah. And then with that is followed, who needs to be trained? How are they trained? How do we monitor it? Uh, how do we make sure that things don't get out of hand, that uh, conduct of our practitioners is continues to be responsible? And that's going to have to be monitored very carefully as well. Yeah. I want to touch on two things, the safety net, and then maybe get a little bit back into training. What do you consider a safety net? Like, have you thought about like, what does that look like when you mean we need to create a safety net for this? Uh, what it means is that we, people understand that there can be adverse uh, experiences by people. I mean, yeah. in the seventies, we saw people who had psychotic episodes. Mm -hmm. We saw people that felt that they continued to feel they came to get help for their anxiety or their depression. And sometimes it made it worse. Uh, obviously we can possibly have medical problems from that. So the safety net is preparing folks to understand that there needs to be full informed consent and that we put in place uh, <clears throat> those uh, opportunities that they get help for what they have when something doesn't go well. Yeah. Have you ever um, looked into alternative residential um, like centers? Like, so I, I used to work at this place called Soteria, which was um, mm. based off of Dr. Laura Mosher's work in the Bay Area. And that was to catch people with early episode psychosis. And they ended up creating one um, in Vermont for a bit. And it's, it's, still, um, it's still around. And you know, it was really interesting because it was alternative. But I think about this a lot because I, I always say, yeah, we need to create this safety net. It's like the psychedelic movement is just happening so quick and there is going to be fallout. And so what does that look like? And I think about some of these alternative models, you know, could somebody go to a, a place like a Soteria house, a respite house to get that kind of support instead of it kind of going down like, you know, that disease model of, of mental health and saying, you know, you're having a, a, a schizophrenic break or a manic break. And this is associated with, uh, you know, psychedelic and really pathologizing people versus creating a nice safe container for people to go to. You know, I know it's tough to probably get insurance coverage for that stuff. Um, Vermont actually supported them, at least for the first year I was there, fully supported, no insurance needed. People could come and live there for three to six months. And you know, I saw some really like magic happen um, just by having that safe container. And so, um, yeah, I don't know, just any thoughts that come I to think mind? so. I mean, look, in, in the 70s, we had a number of those facilities and yeah. they were extremely helpful, particularly for people who had other substance abuse problems or people that had come from very bad situations that they needed a really a period of time in a supportive setting to make a transition and understand what a better life would be like for them. Yeah, They need to kind of like reprogram themselves. And you can't just do that hit and miss or just yeah. one or two sessions. You need an environment, a milieu. Yeah, and we community. used to do milieu therapy. Yeah. In other words, what is the, uh, let's give you a different experience and give it time to settle in. Yeah. So I think it's very important. I frankly, I've, I've had, you know, just as I've explored this area, I think it's really important for our men and women coming out of prisons. Yes. Imagine mm -hmm. what their lives are like and those environments sometimes for years. And we know that they have adjustment problems when they come out. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be more humane? Wouldn't it be wiser for us to take time and put them in a milieu like that yeah. and let them make that transition and understand now what life is like in this setting? I think it's the obviously the thing to do. I mean, we have a high recidivism rate in this country. What, 70%? Well, maybe if we had these options, it would not be quite as much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't, can't even imagine what that's like, but that's got to be a pretty rough transition. And then just thinking about, yeah, the, what people go through in the prison system and maybe looking how, how other countries may do that. There are other countries that do that. Norway's got a number of programs, uh, you know, and I've, with my other work, I've been able to study that a bit. What was so, some of your other work? Well, I do a lot of work when, in the veterans advocacy in terms of those veterans who are already incarcerated. Okay. And some on death row. So, oh, wow. Uh, so I've had a chance to study this. And I think that that's something we need to look at. I mean, that's going to be down the road. At this yeah. point. Right now we've got some, 
some shorter term projects that we have to tackle that are formidable enough. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to see that in the future. Yeah. Um, and then on the training piece, um, you know, I think this is a question that comes up pretty often. Like, how do we train psychedelic practitioners? Like, you know, what competencies do they need? Is the experiential component a requirement to psychedelic training? Yeah, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Well, um, you know, we call it the practice of medicine. Mm-hmm. And the reason it's a practice is that that we as clinicians learn from each patient. Mm. And I remember when I was in medical school, uh, one of the teachers I most respected, he said, you want to be a good doctor? The more patients you see, the better doctor you're going to be. So the training is clinical experience exposure to patients, understanding what they, how uh, they uh, show up, understanding what therapists do, studying what various therapists do, knowing why some patients feel better with certain therapists, and uh, maybe why sometimes they don't feel they're getting their help. And then now we've got a lot of capabilities to take the actual sessions themselves, anonymize them in a way, Mm -hmm. and use them as training tools. Mm. And we need to be thinking about uh, the the technologies we we have, which are just fantastic, right? We've got great and large language. We've got all sorts of ways of doing this and building curricula. Yeah. Amazing. Making and exposing our people so that they can be the best practitioners that they can want to be. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think about the, I guess that experiential component around people having their own psychedelic experiences? I think we have to really unpack that. Yeah. I mean, many of us were as young, young clinicians were told that, uh, look, I think it's really important for you to get into your own therapy or get into your own psychoanalysis. Uh, You need to understand yourself. You're the agent of change. Mm -hmm. And the better that you understand yourself, the better the agent of change that you're going to be. So I think there's a lot uh, having to do with that being uh, grounding uh, for our clinicians. And uh, we are going to really take some time to discuss it and understand how we can do that most effectively. Yeah. Yeah. I was really thankful that um, my grad school actually required uh, therapy as part of the, and I know some grad schools don't do that. And right. I'm like, wow, I'm really thankful that they actually incorporate that in the training. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, sometimes you can read about it, but I, I remember a teacher of mine said, you know, theory goes right out the window sometimes once you start working with people. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So having a lots of exposure is really helpful. So, what do like, practitioners need to know about, like adding psychedelics or maybe psychedelic integration pract- into their practice? Well, I mean, they need to know who who are the right patients for mm-hmm. it. I mean, at what point do you say to a patient, uh, "I think you really would find this the most helpful thing for you to do." Yeah, and this is how we're going to do it. And then they need to understand based on. And, you know, as they think about their practice and what they have in terms of the opportunities in that practice, what they need to learn so that they feel confident that they're doing what their patients are asking from yeah. them. And how do we navigate this like pre-FDA approval um, as, yeah, I mean, a lot of people are really interested in getting involved, but if we're looking at MDMA and psilocybin, people are like, how do I, how do I get involved here? I know a lot of people are going towards ketamine and then starting to advertise integration, but yeah, I don't know any suggestions. Well, that may be a for, that may be a start is to yeah. uh, see what you can learn and do from ketamine, and then knowing that at some point there's going to be a chance to use MDMA or psilocybin. Uh, there may be other opportunities to set up your clinic. There are laws that the FDA has of expanded access, mm-hmm. and that uh, even as a particular medicine is in phase three of a study. There are options of setting up under protocol uh, a clinic that would treat patients. And that may be another opportunity for people to gain experience. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And we're getting really close, it seems like, for FDA approval. Um, Have you been any updates that that you've been hearing around? I don't have any inside, you know, intelligence on that. (laughs) Cool. Cool. (laughs) Sounds good. I mean, I think I heard Rick say hopefully by 2024, MDMA will um, be uh, approved um, by the FDA. So fingers crossed. Right. Fingers crossed. I mean, it's exciting. There's so much happening. What really excites you about this? 
One that we can help people that otherwise don't feel like, I mean, they really need it desperately. I mean, yeah. even, you know, uh, you practice and you treat patients and uh, you use what people say as evidence-based treatments. There's still so many people that don't feel that they're getting help. They'll come in and they'll say, I I really am this close to committing suicide or yeah. I, I'm losing my job. I can't work. Or my family's really at me or I'm at my family. And you go, this is, you know, there must be something better that we could do. There must be something different. And, you know, we're privileged to have the, where society says, we recognize you in your white coat, more or less. Yeah to be someone that we're going to put our trust and confidence to help. That we have to reciprocate with uh, the obligation and, f and, and fulfill that. And so here's an opportunity to do good. And I think that we need to seize it. Yeah. And on that um, just topic, you know, a big conversation that always comes up is accessib accessibility. And, you know, are you hopeful that I, I, it sounded like there's new uh, CPT code that was announced by the AMA, 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 you know, are we feeling hopeful that insurance will cover this? Um, you know, we're seeing in Oregon how the adult use model and how much that's costing, obviously that will drop um, as more service centers open up and, um, you know, it starts to progress, but yeah, any thoughts around accessibility for those people that really need it, that probably can't afford it. I mean, I, I don't, it's not a matter of hope. Yeah. It's a matter of what do you need to do to get the job done? Mm. Okay, we got CPT codes. Okay, we've, yeah. now we, do we have trainers? Do we have practitioners? Do they know what they're doing? What's the need? Where are the people located? What, now let's just start to grind away at this. This is just day-to-day, -day, yeah. practical, hard work. Yeah. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Yes. <laughs> we have yeah. a lot of work ahead yeah, of yeah. us. Um, but it's exciting. And um, how are you feeling being here at Psychedelic Science? Like, uh, what's been exciting for you here? Well, I mean, look, it's a great opportunity. You've got some very committed, enthusiastic people. They've got really good ideas. There's uh, a momentum here. Yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, I think people are really trying to be very practical and realistic. So I think this is a very positive experience, very positive conference. Yeah, yeah. we got it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been coming to psychedelic conferences. I guess my first conference was 2013. Mm -hmm. um, and oh. just seeing the growth and the excitement and mm -hmm. um, I, this feels historical. Um, huh. It feels like there's going to be a lot of forward like momentum after this conference. And um, I'm excited. And, you know, we're here in Colorado and, you know, they did, pro they passed the Prop 122 and things are changing. And, you know, it seems like a lot more states are trying to hop on board to write some of these ballot initiatives. Um, and it, it's just really, really interesting and exciting to see how things have just been, yeah, uh, moving forward so rapidly. I never thought I would see this. I started going to school in 2010 being like, I'm going to study psychedelics and thinking, eh, maybe it will be 50 years out or a little bit later in my career. I didn't think it was would be happening this, this quickly. <laughs> well, I mean, your perspective is really important. I mean, it's you know in 10 years that it's changed like this and yeah. it may be the right time. We maybe have a convergence yeah. of all sorts of factors like that and people saying, wait a minute, we, we've got this. Let's rethink what we're doing. Yeah. We don't have to live with a history that really now shut us out. Uh, this is a different time. And we can do this much better. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, anything that you want to close with for today? Well, I mean, I think that one, we'd like to... Uh, we're trying to build a community of practitioners. Yeah. And uh, we'd like to make extend ourselves to all these people and that it is a community and to be a part of our organization because we're going to do this as we all communicate amongst mm -hmm. ourselves. We collaborate. We learn as we're doing, right? Yeah. We're, even though this has been around for maybe, you know, decades, but hundreds of years, or just we're still going to learn and we've got a lot to go <laughs> yeah. forward. And it's all about us coming together as a community, as a coalition to do what we all think is best awesome. and helpful. And if people are interested in getting involved in APA, how can they learn about APA? Well, there's, there's a great website, 
that uh, our team has put together. And we'd ask them to go to that website and register and join and then come into our community and be part of the conversation. Awesome. And we'll put that in the show notes. And I think off the top of my head, it's appa-us.com maybe? Dot org. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Anything else that you want to close with? No, today? I appreciate it. And thanks for the opportunity. I am uh, for all your work, yeah, thank for all you. you're doing to get the word out. I think it's very important. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate you being here today and it was a pleasure speaking with you. Same so thank here. you. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Steven Zanakis. I know I did. Learned a ton about APA, um, what they're up to, what their goals are. I've been um, hearing about and kind of interfacing with them um, for a year or so, um, kind of getting to know what they're up to. But it was fun to actually finally sit down um, with somebody from the organization to describe um, what, what they're doing. So if you aren't following APA, uh, definitely go over to appa.us.org. That's uh, A-P-P-A dash us.org um, and consider joining, becoming a member, staying up to date of what they're up to because APA is definitely going to be playing a big role in standardizing education, creating this association for practitioners as things come online. So definitely a super important organization to follow and check out. And also definitely go check out uh, their new guidelines. Uh, it's called Professional Practice Guidelines for Psychedelic Assisted Therapy Practitioners. And that was co-published with Brain Futures. And again, you can check that out at their website. You just click on standards and guidelines at the top, um, and then you can download their guidelines there. So I think that's it, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to send us an email, info at psychedelicstoday.com. And if you aren't subscribed to our podcast, please consider subscribing leaving a review. And if you aren't following us on social media, please do so wherever you hang out on the interwebs. Um, Great way to stay up to date what we're doing, um, any events, any upcoming offerings, and just general uh, psychedelic news and education. So hope you are having a beautiful week whenever you're listening to this, and we will catch you on the next episode of Psychedelics Today. 